pins, Basil, pins, double pins. We have a New Jersey update for the Charlotte Hornets. We'll talk about Kelly Oubre's free agency update as well. Then, of course, we got to get to the list. All today on Locked On Hornets. You are Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, cause we live. We live. We live. <laughs> It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen, as always. We're free. We're available anywhere you get your podcast, And that includes YouTube. A nodding Doug, because he's excited about what we're going to talk about. Find his work on his Substack, everyhornetsboxscore.com. I'm Walker Mail. You can check me out on the radio, WFNC 92.7 FM, every weekday, Wes and Walker, from 12 to 3 p.m. We're excited, Doug, because we got to see what was a glorious video our point guard now, our point guard of the late 90s, early 2000s. They got a lot of people to be fans of the Charlotte Hornets, a really exciting player in Baron Davis alongside LaMelo Ball promoting a throwback jersey night. A couple of them, I would imagine. And yes, the sales, they're going to be real. They're going to promote the jerseys on their team shop as well. But that's okay. I think there's going to be a lot of sales there. So we get to see the team get honored in a way where, yeah, they're doing the whole throwback jersey thing. But that team hasn't been honored a ton. Yeah. If you go back to the team that actually did get the furthest in the postseason, had the second round exit, but a seven game exit against Milwaukee, mm -hmm. who would eventually lose to Philly mm -hmm. and Philly would go to the finals. But that team, I think, got a lot of people to be fans of this franchise. And to see Baron Davis in that video be celebrated, we're talking about the top 35 players of all time list. And yeah. I was looking at the starting lineup, spoiler alert. Every one of the players in the starting lineup is in the top 25, not even 35, top 25, because yeah. they were well-rounded. They just don't celebrate them, Doug, because, well, right up until they left, I mean, or th that was the team that left, right? That was the last iteration of the first franchise that we knew. Yeah, and it wasn't the players' fault, obviously, but the right. fans didn't show up for those last few years in the same way that they had shown up for you know previous eras. And I'm not even talking about the, the sort of golden age of Muggsy, LJ, and Zoe. They didn't even show up like they showed up for, for Glenn Rice and Vladi and, and those teams. And so, yeah, it was a weird time to be a Hornets fan. It was a weird time to play on that team. If you go back and, and read interviews from Baron Davis – they were they were conflicted as players because they're going out there. They've got a good squad. They've got I mean, mm -hmm. I think everyone thought that Jason Kidd and that New Jersey Nets team in 2002 was going to run through the Eastern Conference. But the Charlotte Hornets felt like they could give them a run. And, you know, so that they had that feeling. And yet they looked in the stands and they didn't see the, the fans coming out because the fans knew by that point that the team was heading to New Orleans. Uh, so it was weird feelings all around. I'm glad the team, even if it is for cynical merch sales, we're celebrating the 35th anniversary for some reason, five years after right. the 30th anniversary. Even if if it's for all that, if it gets us double pinstripes, if it gets us returning players like Baron Davis, like P.J. Brown, uh, you know, like David Wesley, you know, if, if we can bring more guys like that back into the fold, you know, hopefully – when the Hornets have some legitimate success of their own and they get, you know, playoff berths and playoff series right. wins of their own, then we won't have to fully rely on this nostalgia. But hopefully it will also coax some other players that have been, I think, a little bit more resistant to coming back, like, say, a Larry Johnson, to celebrate in some current Hornet success while also – uh, understanding where it all came from. But it was so cool, the video. Like, I love the double pinstripe jersey. That's great. I have yeah. a couple hanging on my wall. You can see the Jamal Mashburn one uh, behind me. That's great. I'll probably buy one. That's that's fun. But seeing Baron Davis, B. Diddy, hanging out with LaMelo Ball, yeah. that's cool. And I hope B. Diddy shared some wisdom. I hope he shared some, like, you know, playoff grind wisdom with our guy LaMelo Ball. Look, because I, I, don't, I don't know, like, what the circumstances were to bring back Baron Davis. But it's not like Baron Davis has to. Um, Baron Davis has never talked poorly about his time in Charlotte, but he's also more well known as a Golden State Warrior, I would say, than a, than a Charlotte Hornet yeah. nationally. So he doesn't have to do this. So he does it, and that's cool. 
Right, yeah, and, and I think Barron was so exciting on good Charlotte Hornets teams at the beginning of his career. He was a high draft pick. I think people recognize his time in Charlotte, but when you are the We Believe team and you are the face of that for the most part and you beat the one-seed Dallas Mavericks, it was that accomplishment that probably gears you a little more to think of him as a Golden State Warrior, and uh, that that's probably true. But, Doug, just like I mentioned, I think from that team – you go, you choose Baron Davis. One, he's in the media a little bit more than you might think. <laughs> in a, in a very Lebitard. fun way. He is very yeah, eclectic. Very fun um, he speaks his mind. He's a very he's a very fun listen and oh, or watch. Yeah, 100 percent We're fans of the Dan Levitard show. He's had some incredible moments with Levitard. A couple of awkward but funny awkward moments with Levitard. Also, one of the best celebrity couples ever. Uh, how about Baron Davis and Laura Dern dating right. for a time? So he got in the, in the mainstream there just a little bit. But also, I think they choose Baron Davis because he was, for the most part, people's favorite player because he was so exciting. Man, athletic point guard. You know, somebody that when we talk about Derrick Rose, John ja Morant, and then we're trying to compare a Scoot Henderson to some of the more mm -hmm. athletic point mm -hmm. guards, Russell Westbrook. Man, B. Diddy's probably... You could put him top five if you wanted to in somewhat of that era, you know, just as far as the explosiveness. He was in a dunk contest. It did not go well for him. The blind man's bluff did not go well for him, but he was good enough to be in the dunk pretty contest. Sure he can see, pretty sure he could see through that, though, still. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe. But, you know, my age, right, there's a little bit of an age gap between us, I think five years. But my age group, their favorite player was Baron. I mean, in, and if you wanted to be a hipster, you might choose a David Wesley. You might choose somebody else. But everybody loved Baron Davis, and I'm glad they brought him back. Well, and he he had the, the moments. The the dunk contest was was not necessarily a highlight, but it was a moment. Yeah. Um, and he he had some of the most incredible dunks in that first run of Hornets history. And then he had uh, the 86 foot game winner. I think it's the yep. longest game winning shot in NBA history, chronicled by John Boyce for SB Nation, if you want to go look that oh, up. I think it was a YouTube. buzzer beater. Was it a game winner or was it just a buzzer beater? I, I didn't, you're yeah, right, I you're right. Well, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thanks for the correction. I think it was like a third quarter shot. It was a buzzer beater. <laughs> it wasn't it was a game. the length of the court. Yeah, it's the longest one. Right. And he also, a shot that didn't count, but I think changed NBA, the way NBA games were officiated was a playoff game against Orlando where there was point, I believe 0.4 seconds left on the clock. Yeah. And Barron hits a shot. They disallow the shot. There wasn't replay at the time because no one thought that you could catch and shoot with 0.4 seconds. They felt like at that point, no, you've got it, grab it, tap it, you know. But Barron pulled it off. And and they went back and looked at it. And then referees had to go, okay, you've got to you know, you've got to pay attention here. It, 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 it can cool be a catch and shoot shot. Yeah. Catch and shoot. That's shot. a sick That's rule. Cool. The fact that you, Oh, you're, <laughs> I am not bound by these limits. I can get this shot off in 0.4 seconds. And now it's 0.3 as long as I can honestly remember being a basketball fan. So yeah, that's a really cool yeah. rule. And I think they won um, that game. If my memory, sir, I think they ended up winning that playoff mm -hmm. game. I could be wrong about that because I think it was tied and that would have, that would have won it. But I think they went on to an overtime period and maybe won that playoff a game against the, against the Magic. But yeah, I mean, Baron Davis, one of the more exciting players in that late run and and helped – that team needed offense. I mean, Baron and, and Mash were the offense because that team was driven by Paul Silas and a very tough defense. Yeah, they're the um, creators for sure, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, that was – yeah, I'm, I'm glad that he's back. And I hope they – I hope through this process this season – they bring some of the other guys back, like Wesley and Brown and Eldon Campbell. Yep. I can show him my beanie baby. I mean, you know, have sweet. a good time. <laughs> He'd probably call you weird, but also it'd be very cool <laughs> to see that interaction between you two. Uh, let's, let's share. So in case you don't know what video we're talking about, it's the Twitter video the Hornets released, right? So just go to their Twitter account. You can go check it out. It's Baron Davis, LaMelo Ball. They're playing horse. They actually have a couple of long shots in there, too, from Baron Davis's 86 We got We got to figure something else out for LaMelo. It feels like every video I know. of LaMelo no Ball. Curry. Yeah. It's all horse. that's where he's most comfortable. We've it must be his favorite game. It must be yeah. his favorite game. He enjoys playing it. You can get him to have a good time. We should note that we're seeing LaMelo Ball out front in the media a lot more since he signed that contract. Makes sense, right? You give him the bag, you give him the max sure. contract. Now, all of a sudden, this is when you become the face of the franchise, right? We were all wondering, when is 
When is LaMelo going to get the keys to the franchise? When will he be the face? Well, now he is the face because they're paying him. A, they're going to be paying him a lot of money. And so the franchise, look, you can't really say no at this point, right? If you're LaMelo, if you get $260 million potentially dollars from the franchise, mm-hmm. if they say, hey, we need you to come hang out with Baron Davis for an afternoon and do a little photo shoot, you got to kind of say yes at this point. <laughs> and he does seem to be cool with those relationships. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like I said, I, I've referenced that Del Curry shoot around a couple of times in that maybe being the best on-camera interview LaMelo's ever done. I, and it's it's funny because you have to go into the depths to try to find the damn thing, but it's, he's just so much more comfortable and seems to be having a lot more fun doing that with Dell than, of course, running off the floor, standing at the podium. Like, it's completely understandable. But, yeah, let, let's actually – you know what? That's a smart play by the Hornets. It's let's get you on the court. Let's be loosey-goosey. Yeah. Let's get somebody that speaks your language because they've played at a high level in the NBA before. And let's hear your thoughts. And also, why don't you go ahead and look good in a throwback uni because we know LaMelo's about fashion as well. I mean, it, it it's perfect for him. It suits him really well. And we need to see more of it. Now that, he's, now that the contract's out of the way, the first contract's out of the way, the injuries seem to be out of the way, he's fully healthy, I'm, there needs to be a camera following him around at all times. And we... You know, I hope that the organization really <laughs> opens up the vault on LaMelo Ball yeah. behind the scenes footage because Hornets fans need an icon now to rally around so that we don't constantly have to remember the icons of the past. Yeah, 70th anniversary. We want LaMelo coming back and no bridges <laughs> burned there. That's what we want. All right, coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Maybe we can finish some of those details on the jerseys that were revealed, the throwbacks that they're going to wear. And then we'll get into at least one Kelly Oubre update that's kind of interesting. We'll get to that in just a moment. But now before we bring up Ibotta, this episode is brought to you by Ibotta. If you are trying to finally take that summer vacation you've been planning, but dreading buying all of the necessities before you take off, it's time to stop spending your hard-earned money without getting anything in return. Enter Ibotta. Ibotta gives you cash back on hundreds of grocery items from produce to personal care to pantry goods so you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. Either link your loyalty account or upload your receipt after you shop and you can get cash back. It's really just that easy. The average Ibotta user earns $120 per year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip or you could use your cash back to buy that flight you've been eyeing, that game you're dying to go to or that fancy dinner you've been craving for a while now. Other apps give you points. They don't really amount to much. With Ibotta, you get real cash back that you can cash out to your bank account, PayPal, or even gift cards. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using the code LOCKED when you register. Just go to the App Store, Google Play Store, download the free Ibotta app, and use code LOCKED. That's Ibotta, I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store, and use code LOCKED, L-O-C-K-E-D. More Locked on Hornets coming up next. This is Locked on Hornets. I'm a fantastic Googler. I'm bad at logging in. If they were to do sort of a scouting report of of me and my ability to use the internet. Todd, 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 Todd. Yeah, I, Excellent Googler. Not a very good guy that's logging in. Very yeah. good at interrupting the host anytime he's trying to go on a rant. It's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. All right, Doug, let's get to some of the details here just real quickly with this, uh, with these double pins making an appearance once again. Anything of note there that the Charlotte Hornets released during this promotion? Uh, yeah, the, these jerseys will be featured during eight home games this ser- uh, season, which I think they're going to do a whole thing about. I don't know if you saw the schedule release video, uh, but it was not only a nod back to the 97 through 2002 team, it was a really a taking you through the 88 to 2002 to through the Bobcats and, and into now evolution of the franchise through music. And so I think all of that's going to be part of the festivities here during these eight home games. Don't know when the schedule of those games are yet. It looks like they're going to unveil that in early September. And uh, that, I think, is all of the details. Oh, and and those jerseys will be available for purchase sometime in the fall. No date on that. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Eight games. It's a good bit. I I mean, it's about the same as always, but still, it's a good bit of time that we're going to get to see them in those jerseys. I don't think we're going to see Kelly Oubre ever in that jersey, but he still isn't signed yet. I mean, still 
not one team has signed Kelly, PJ Washington, you know, some of these other free agents. If you don't get signed in that first, I don't know, two weeks or the first wave, then this thing could play out a very long time for you. And that's what a couple of Hornets now are experiencing. We talked about PJ earlier this week. With Kelly, we got an update from a guy named Greg Sylvander on Twitter. Hey, Greg. He is a Miami Heat NBA insider and analyst. You can find him on Twitter at Greg Sylvander, S-Y-L, to see this for yourself. But according to Greg Sylvander, he said, if the Heat do finally ever figure out a Dame trade, watch for both Christian Wood and Kelly Oubre to be on the team's radar as possible vet minimum additions and free agency per league source. So don't know if that's true. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Hmm. And if the Dame thing actually happens, Mm -hmm. Kelly Oubre could be on Miami Heat Watch. My question to bring this back home to the Hornets is, well, (laughs) visit this like every couple of weeks or so with Kelly. Hey, is there a chance? That's basically what we're asking. Kelly Oubre on the vet minimum, Doug. Does that increase the likelihood that he could return to the Charlotte Hornets if it is on that specific contract? I don't think so. Because to me, it's not about the money. It's about the opportunity for Kelly Oubre to break through in this wing rotation. And even if you say, well, but what about injuries? What, what, you know, yeah, there are a lot of wings that are going to be battling for minutes in this rotation. But what if one of two of them get hurt? Then all of a sudden you need Kelly Oubre. Well, yes, you would need, you would need help. You would need depth at any position if, if you were serious about contending in the Eastern Conference. I don't believe this Hornets franchise is super serious about doing it. If they happen to, if they, you know, beep, 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 if they back into the Eastern Conference playoff discussion accidentally, okay, great. I mean, nobody's going to be mm-hmm. mad about that. But you don't bring in Frank Nilakina as your option at backup point guard if you really are serious. You don't not get on the phone with Dennis Smith Jr., who was your defensive uh, workhorse and also just offensive spirit uh, put uh, put the Mavericks bleep in the dirt last season and one of the more impressive wins. You don't let that guy go to Brooklyn because you don't make him a priority. If you're serious about making a run into the playoffs in the Eastern Conference, their vision is more long term. And so if you're not serious about that, then to me, it makes no s- sense to stack your roster with guys like Kelly Oubre when you're pretty set at that wing position already yeah the vet minimum it's pretty it's a pretty negligible risk so that would be the only reason as to why i wouldn't hate it and you could bring him back and he's not gonna be happy but why would you want an unhappy kelly Oubre? that's that's right that's right kelly Oubre probably doesn't want to come back on a vet minimum (laughs) yeah i'm I'm sorry i interrupted you people don't like it when i interrupt you they get very upset with me and they get in the comments i just want to just preempt that with an apology (laughs) i get emotional because here's the because i have to say this i have Mm -hmm. to really make this clear yeah i respect the hell out of kelly Oubre. i really do and i really appreciate what he did for for the franchise last season in a difficult year he changed his game he he did up his defense a little bit, not enough, obviously, to get some consideration from some other teams in the offseason. I think he still has the stigma of, like, Tsunami Poppy, totally offensive guy, and not going to give you enough on the defensive end. But but he did some things, he made some adjustments, and he got some buckets for a team that needed buckets. So I respect that. And so I don't want what I say to be interpreted as like, oh, this guy's just pooping all over Kelly Oubre. I'm not doing that. Uh, I just think that this situation would not be good for Kelly, and it wouldn't make sense for the Hornets. Yeah, Kelly Oubre has been vocal about wanting to start in the past. He wanted to start with Golden State. He wanted to start here. He also said he wants to be here. But if Brandon Miller is going to be a guy that you do try to shift to, Steve Clifford could decide that he wants Kelly Oubre to play over Brandon Miller. And because of the whole rookie thing and because of that stigma from that be Steve po- Clifford. That would be apocalyptic. Right. That would be apocalyptic. Well, right. Uh, I mean, you'd, you'd rather just see Brandon in there. But yeah, Kelly Oubre, I can't imagine, wants to, to to play on a vet minimum while his minutes are at a minimum, too. So remember, this is another interesting question for me. I haven't thought about it until just now. If you go back to last offseason, we all know the Miles Bridges thing that took place at the beginning. So Miles gets arrested. Mm-hmm. That's before free agency hits. Right. Kelly Oubre, the offseason before, 
had signed a non-guaranteed contract. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think the Charlotte Hornets move off of Kelly Oubre, even if Miles Bridges agrees to a deal. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if that just cemented Kelly Oubre's stance here. Just, mm -hmm. okay, now we're not bringing Miles. We're not going to do anything with outside help. Now it's easy. Now we're definitely picking up that extra year on the non-guaranteed contract. But yeah. if he did sign long-term, then I do wonder how that changes things with Kelly, if at all. And and probably the likelihood's low, but maybe Kelly understands, oh, Miles here, yeah, my minutes are going to go down even more so because they're paying him like a franchise cornerstone. Uh, you know, I want to go look elsewhere, whatever, right? Or, or maybe it's just the Hornets deciding to get some outside help. But once Miles gets arrested, and they're like, well, we need a score, and he's already here, and we'll just pick up $12 million on the non-guaranteed contract I, I wonder i wonder how that how much that played into kelly if at all which is also possible look if we're talking about kelly Ubre and christian wood both getting picked up on the veteran min minimum i mean i would be more interested in christian wood at this point adding a little bit of offensive punch to to your uh, front court rotation uh that would to me that would be more interesting uh former hornet returning on a veteran minimum than kelly Ubre at this point because then you know, really, if you look at the center rotation, you are one injury away from uh-oh town. I mean, you're kind of in uh-oh town anyway when you're depending on a rookie who's still learning and Nick Richards, uh, you know, who might show up on my nickname list, spoiler alert. But, wow. he, you know, he, okay. you know, is someone that we're I'm still unsure about. I don't know if he has a three-point shot. I don't know if he's hiding it. I don't know if, if last season, if those improvements were just like a fluke. You know, there's a lot of unknowns in that center rotation. So, you know, adding – Adding someone that has, you know, problems. Obviously, it's there's a reason why I think unfairly he's maligned a little bit and getting veteran minimum talk here. But if that's going to be the opportunity, What's I think the attitude the should, with yeah, yeah, I mean, pe totally. People don't but, love but if you're demeanor. not, but again, if you're not, so I'll go back to my argument at the beginning of the segment. If you're not serious about making a playoff run and you're okay with like a one year veteran minimum, let's take a chance here, see what we got, see if the attitude problems have gone away, even if they haven't. It's an easy thing to get out of at that point. You're not committing long term. I would rather do that than than worry about Kelly Oubre. Yeah, we'll see. And the other thing is, if if somebody out there would give Kelly more than the vet minimum, then I wonder if he would take that, even if it meant not playing for a contender. But another key part of that tweet was if a Dame trade goes down. So if the Miami Heat are going to contend, then maybe Kelly and Christian would decide to take less money but also be you know good enough bench pieces to come in and play some sort of role on a contender, whereas Charlotte is not going to contend like Miami, especially if Damian Lillard is on that squad. And Miami, that team, and Spolstra, that scheme, are experts at hiding players with, with defensive issues. I'm going to do it all the time. And mm -hmm. so Kelly, I think that Kelly can probably get to an extra gear under that heat culture, and you know, I, maybe the argument, the better argument to make for signing Kelly Oubre for the Hornets to a veteran minimum is just so that Miami doesn't do it and turn Kelly Oubre into one of these bench wrenches that's, that they always turn players into. Maybe point. that's the best argument is just, no, we just need to hoard all these players so that Miami can't have them. Right. We're, we're not allowing you to have Caleb Martin 2.0. Nope. <laughs> right. And we're going to bring him back and you're not going to turn him into an absolute playoff stud. All right, one more segment to go. Coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. It's time. We get to the top 35 list, the best nicknames, and the best players in Charlotte Hornets history. It's coming up next on Locked On Hornets. All right, it's time for the list. We've been going way over on a couple of these episodes because we bog down and we focus on a nickname or a name. <laughs> So we're gonna to try to grind through some of this, okay? Oh, we're, can I can I pause for just a second? I, at least yes. I'm asking permission to interrupt, okay? Yes, no, you I, have permission. I would like to pause and observe that we do too much research during the silly season, and probably not enough research at all other times. <laughs> like this is yep. this is the one time that we decide, all right, we're going to be the nerdy show. We're going to dig into the weeds, and it's mm -hmm. to talk about Tom Chambers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's to tell you about world-class glass. That's when we do our best research. All right, so we're going to try to avoid that, okay? No more research. And no more working hard. Uh, let's, let's just rapid fire, lightning okay. round. Let's go through some of these names as best we can. Honestly, we're probably still going to bog down. All right, nicknames, Doug. Where are you at and who's next up on the list? All right, we just did number 23, Tommy Gunn, Tom Chambers. Now we're moving on to number 22, current player, Terry Rozier, nickname, Scary okay. Terry. That's a good one. 
Scary Terry is a great one. Um, Scarence Terrence, people like to play off of it. That that's my analysis. Well, yeah, Scarence to me, Scarence Terrence is when he's not having a great game, and there were a lot of those last season when he was forced to play point guard, mm-hmm. and those shots weren't falling, and he wasn't as clutch as he had been in previous years. That's when Scarence Terrence shows up. But this hopefully, guy's a gangsta. His real name is Terrence. Yeah, that's definitely the version that hits. He went to Cranbrook. Scarence Terrence went to Cranbrook, <laughs> and Scary Terry is Papa Doc. I don't understand that reference, but I'm going to laugh along with you to give you support. It's eight mile, eight mile oh, reference. Okay, so okay, 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 okay. Okay, got it. Um, so anyway, uh, scary Terry, love the nickname. I also, I think I coined this. I'm going to take credit for it. The scary shuffle when he makes that little sidestep mm-hmm. move in the corner to get his three off. Um, love that move. You did you know that Terry Rozier is top ten in nine career franchise categories? Yes, I did because I've been doing research. But yes, I did know that, including points, by the way. Including Inclu- he's eighth in points. Um, mm-hmm. He is sixth in points per game, and he's eighth in offensive box plus minus. He's not in the top ten though in offensive rating. Do you know who is number one in franchise history in offensive rating? Did your research uncover that? Hmm, I don't think it did. Um, man, could it be Lamelo? It is not Lamelo Ball. Okay. In fact, it's the number uh, 21 on my list of top nicknames of all time. It is the one, the only, the Plum Dog Millionaire, Mason Plumley is your offensive rating leader in Hornets franchise history. Congratulations, Mason. <laughs> uh, left-handed shot and all. Uh, that has to be because, man, did he lead the league in field goal percentage last year? He came close to it if he didn't lead, so... Okay, I did not expect that, but Plum Dog Millionaire, it's amazing. It's a great nickname, so I'm glad that it's it's seen the light of day. Maybe even a little low, but it doesn't matter. Plum Dog Millionaire, this is great. It's fine. I don't know that it makes a, a ton of sense when you think about the movie and the plot of the movie uh, and, and what it means for Mason <laughs> Plumley. Well, these I- nicknames are supposed to rhyme, Doug. Like, you don't have to fit the character. <laughs> you just It just has to rhyme. I'm, I'm totally with you, and I appreciate a great rhyme all the time. But mm-hmm. I'm just telling you, it gets po- that's oh, why it's I'm- 21 and not top 10. And, you know, Plum Dog Millionaire, I will remember the millionaire yeah. part. I will remember Mason Plumley shooting the little money gun <laughs> in the video, yes, in the rap video. <laughs> oh, so good. So many great Mason Plumley memories. All right, number 20, we're moving along. Lightning round here. Number 20, this is an oldie but a goodie. Stacy Ogman. The Plastic Man. Yeah. The, the random ones, too. The ones that rhyme are great. But also, when you hear a Plastic Man, you might appreciate the ones that make no sense, but all the more sense in the world. Love the Plastic Man nickname. Well, Stacy Augman was the Plastic Man because he was given this nickname in college uh, because of his athleticism. And if you go look at his mixtape on YouTube, if you go look at some of the highlights, you'll understand completely because he would drive... He would get right under the rim and then somehow his arm would extend what felt like three feet away from the rim while there were three guys covering him. And then the ball goes in the basket. His body did not operate under the normal human physics that a body should operate on because he was made. He wasn't made of human mortal uh, flesh and tissue. Mm. He was made of plastic. He was the plastic man. Mm. It gives you uh, superhero vibes. So I love this. I probably under honestly, I I have it at 20 because Stacey Augman, like not a big Hornets name. Right. You know, more more known for his time with Atlanta. But uh, I just love this nickname. Um, would you say that he augmented his body in order to <laughs> dunk it and dive? No? Okay. I like it. <laughs> All right, number 19. I uh, telegraphed this. It is Nick Richards. Big Nick Energy. <laughs> oh, that one. <laughs> this, I can't believe. This is top 20. What, no, what number is this? This is number 19, yeah. It's oh, just snuck in, it snuck to into top the top 20, 20 uh, all-time okay. nicknames in franchise history. And here's why. Timely nickname, too. I mean, Nick Richards does not get this nickname in the early 2000s. He does no, not he does get not. this nickname in the 90s. It's a You had to be there moment. And as soon as we got a Nick on the roster, the Millennials, Generation Z, they were ready to take this and run with it. That's exactly and, and what exactly, and you you feed right into my point here, which is that it felt like when Nick jumped onto the scene and started putting back every shot 
and running up and down the floor and doing crazy things that we didn't expect Nick Richards. We didn't expect Nick Richards to do anything, anything. Mm -hmm. And so when he did something and then he did something else and then he did something crazy, it's like we all collectively came up with this nickname. You know, some of these nicknames are given, you know, in the old days it was given by a beat writer. Sometimes uh, the nicknames are given by a, a fellow player during an interview or a lot of too. times it yeah. happens like Eric Collins, the broadcaster, will come up yep. with something funny. But this felt like something that just came from Twitter, from the Hive, and everybody was like, Big Nick Energy. Like, this is what it is. Don't, no, no discussion mm -hmm. necessary. It birthed itself from nothing. It is the big bang of nicknames. <laughs> like, it just, and and that mm -hmm. works too, you know? Um, so, yeah, Big Nick Energy. Hey, yo. Finally. Got any more? I can do it. I have on. one more. Okay. Number 18, Lee Nalon. Nails. Yes. <laughs> It's the most random Hornets player. I, I love him. I freaking love him, man. Nothing but Nalon. It's so good. He I love the nickname. The guy that helped out in that year where the Hornets actually left. Big time score. Crazy career. I'm glad that he makes the list. Nails 18. Totally deserves it. Yeah, Nails is a, a great name. He was uh, just a score, just a pure score. Didn't really do anything else. A, a little in the Kelly Oubre early poppy mold. Mm -hmm. Um, th that was that was nails. He was a scoring mercenary, tough scorer, could finish inside, could get his shot really from anywhere, knew how to separate. Uh, but but did uh, he does make another list, which is and there are a number of players on this list, players that butted head with Paul Silas. <laughs> um, I'm sure he did. Yeah. And and, and eventually uh, led to his departure from the Hornets uh, before they or right at the time when they moved to New Orleans during that transition. Paul Silas uh, uh, let N Lee Nalon go and, and eventually found his way to New York and became a journeyman from there. Um, but it was all it was all because of defense like Paul Silas demanded even from his offensive mercenaries. He demanded some level of competent defense and Nalon uh, and, and defensive effort. And, and mm -hmm. Lee Nalon was not able to provide. Anyway, uh, fun fun names, and I've got many more. That's the nickname list. Let's get to your top 35 players in franchise. All right, so you have 17. I, I did one show without you, so I'm going to be a little ahead. Uh, I did the best of the rest, 20 to 15. And so now we're going to go a category 15 through 12, so just four players instead of five today. This category is Doug Gets Mad at Me. That's this category, and you could already. <laughs> I mean, this could All be right, the we'll whole see. list. We'll but, see. But but this this well, we're we're gonna realize it right away. Uh, Doug gets mad at me, so we're gonna start with fifteen, and uh, I don't want to do it, but I I I have to after all the research that I did. Jamal Mashburn, number fifteen, Doug. This is the one. Just, uh, just unbelievable. I mean, fifteen. So, Fif all right. 15 where was he in your list last last time five years ago he was 15 oh, yeah. look everybody assaulted you for this <laughs> no it's not even just a me thing you're right this immediately angered me you, you were absolutely you're dead on bullseye you nailed it because it's not even just me like i'm obviously a mashburn fan i'm an acolyte mm -hmm. i'm going to stand for mash yeah. uh, monster mash it's my mm -hmm. nickname on some video games that i play monster mashburn and so i'm gonna stand <laughs> That's pretty good i didn't know that I'm going to stand, but it's not just me. There are legions of us For sure. that, that, For sure. that come at your throat, that came at your throat during the 30th mm -hmm. anniversary. And so you took mm -hmm. all of that, you ingested all of that, and then yep. decided, I have an opportunity to uh, amend this. And you were even kind of apologetic at the time. And, and yet you've come to all of that and decided, no, nah, I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm apologetic now. I'm apologetic now. I don't want to because I grew up loving Jamal Mashburn as well. And that matters. I get it. I just, I'll, I'll, I'll go towards the next couple of guys on the list and then All we right. can dissect. All right. All so right. 15 is Jamal Mashburn. Number 14, Eddie Jones. Eddie Jones comes in at number 14. I'm not mad at this one. Eddie Jones, it's a, it's a complicated thing because he didn't play here a long time, but he did acquire one of those rare all NBA honors in Hornets history. Uh, so he deserves, deserves love. But the question always is because of the length of stay, you know, how much right. love longevity, but Eddie, I mean, just a monster year, the biggest one year impact that the Hornets have ever received. So give me Eddie Jones at number 14 at number 13, David Wesley, number 13. Feels feels good. Doesn't feel like uh, a top, you know, 
and this is kind of Wesley's whole thing, right? He was mm -hmm. a a two, you know, a, a Robin to to a couple of Batmans. So it doesn't feel like that deserves to be top 10. And yet longevity, big play here for Wesley, who continued on into New Orleans. Uh, so lo love David Wesley, but I, I'm not mad at this one. You're, you're, you are dead on on the Mashburn piece. Yeah. But so far, I'm, I'm with you. Well, okay. And, and so here's the last one. We'll, we'll get to number 12 before we get to the top 11. Uh, number 12, the final one in the Doug Gets Mad at Me category, Kendall Gill. Kendall Gill comes in at number 12. Part of the golden age, three years, had a second stint with the Charlotte Hornets in a very weird area. Average uh -huh. more points than you remember. Actually, big contributor when we talk about LJ, Alonzo, Muggsy, Kendall Gill, <laughs> the forgotten about guy, but was a monster. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Kendall Gill, Eddie, that was all of this is hard, right? I could say that about every single category. But ultimately, I decided to go Jamal Mashburn, 15. David Wesley, number 14, Eddie Jones, number 13, or excuse me, Eddie Jones, number 14, David Wesley, number 13, Kendall Gill, 12. The thing about Kendall Gill is that had it not been for that Eddie Jones season, we would still be saying that Eddie Jones is the best, I mean, that that Kendall Gill is the best shooting guard in, in Hornets franchise history, right? I mean, yeah. this is not a franchise that has had a storied uh, relationship with the shooting guard position and now it's probably terry i mean i feel like if you just look at at the numbers it's it's terry under eddie jo eddie jones until there's a shooting guard that has an all nba i don't think you can say you know that there well, was a kendall, better one i mean kendall was a better player i think than terry rogier i you don't think so uh probably i mean different eras it's tough to it's always tough to like figure that out well, um but let, I, let I me, think me, I think just in terms uh, of pure contributions, I mean, I would give it, you know, that's always a discussion. Talent versus, you know, how much a guy is accumulated, compiled. Well, let me give you let me give you some stats Educate real me. quickly as we grind, right? So I have Kendall Gill in here, Golden Age, played 266 games with the Charlotte Hornets, averaged over 15 points per game, and you see 11 in his rookie year with the Hornets, 20 and a half his second season. So big time sophomore glow up third year average 17 points per game. That was the 92, 93 season. So then he goes to Seattle, comes back with the Hornets for just a little bit and then goes to the New Jersey Nets, but also efficient from the field facilitated at a pretty nice level four assists per game for him. Did a little bit of everything defensively. Very good player, I think maybe still holds the NBA record for most steals in a game with 11. Yeah. So got that, defensively, over, got that over Rozier for sure. Uh, defensively, Kendall Gill was a monster. That's why I have him there and a forgotten about guy that was a huge part to some of those successful teams. David Wesley coming in at number 13, played the most games out of anybody that we're talking about here. 362, 358 of which he started. So, a lot of time 97 98 was his first season last season was the last season that the hornets were in charlotte and double digit score really good shooter um actually facilitated as well had a six assist season in there 5.6 assists per game season in there you know you're right was probably the robin on a lot of these teams but on different iterations here's the thing about eddie jones and jamal mashburn doug so we all think of Eddie Jones. It's crazy, right? We all think of Eddie Jones as this guy that came for one season, and that was it. Eddie Jones played 102 games with the Charlotte Hornets. Jamal Mashburn played 116. He only played 14 more games well, than injured. Eddie did. Yeah, he, had, well, he I know. had a number of injuries, yeah. No, I know. You're right, but that's crazy, right? Like, I, mm -hmm. I didn't think that. And then he only played 14 more games with the Hornets ever. Now, you get to a postseason, really important player, the, the Jamal is kind of a guy where he was a good shooter and he facilitated at a better level. The two point field goal percentage for Jamal is really weird. It's one of those like almost Iverson effects when you go back in hindsight, which isn't fair. So I'm not blowing them out of the top 20 by any means, but the two point field goal percentage is really weird. So give me, give me West. Yeah, that's kind of nerdy. But when you're talking about longevity, which has to play into some of this, he played the second least amount of games, didn't give you an all NBA type season that Eddie Jones did during his mercenary campaign. Uh, give me give me Jamal at number 15. I hate to do it, but we're, we're getting into the moment now where it actually does get a little difficult to move up in the ranks. It's really easy. 
in Charlotte Hornets history, but now it's a little difficult. You don't have That's Mashburn out of the top 15 or top 20 yet, but just give it five years. I mean, we'll be doing this all again in five years. So, you know, let's just wait till then to have him at like <laughs> 30. I mean, it's I know. It's, it's the it's the one I, I dislike the most to reveal to the people, to be honest with you. Uh, did get to the foul line a lot, though, Jamal. And man, did have big moments, right? But he was also, man, wasn't he hurt in the postseason? What you you know about that a little bit more than I do, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, his his injury in the postseason uh, really stunted their ability in that final postseason run uh, to make anything happen. And again, they were going to move regardless. It wouldn't have it wouldn't have changed yeah. anything. Okay, uh, but it would have given given us something uh, to to smile about as we waited for <laughs> the coming of the Bobcat. Uh, but <laughs> Mash Mash made that offense. Uh, and, and again, that team was fully defense, and and even you know, with Baron Davis on that team, though, I mean, you needed. Was, Matt, I mean, you, you needed. Look, Baron Davis had to drive to score. Mash could get a shot. Mash was the Gordon Hayward, the Nick Batum, the guy you have to have true. on your team. And he was also probably injured as much as those guys, unfortunately. But like, yeah. you needed to have that guy on the team that you could throw the ball to, the release valve that could get their shot from anywhere uh, and get it on their own. Uh, the Hornets, uh, this team will still be continuing to look for that. They're hoping that Brandon Miller evolves into that guy. So there you go. I, wrapped, I finally yeah. wrapped it back all around to the current team. There you go. Yeah, a good three-point shooter too, Jamal Mashburn. I will say that, you know, pretty good. Um, all right, that'll do it for the top 35 list. That is the Doug gets mad at me category from 15 to 12. We'll move on as we get closer to the regular season. Thanks again for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your pods, especially when the season starts. Make sure you're making your second listen game to game NBA every moment, every top play, every performance. Only Locked On can deliver what is great analysis on every single matchup in the association. Thanks again for uh, making us your first listen, man. I guess we'll be back with you on Monday, uh, maybe Tuesday of next week. We'll take a break tomorrow and we'll see. We'll see. (laughs) We're going to find out. You'll find out next week. Have a great weekend.